recording and there you go so today we'll continue on the topic from uh uh functional programming and this is basically one of the basically one of the most important thing that show up and we haven't really formally discussed it yet right uh which is type and the type system right if you finish assignment one or if you are in the process of working on assignment one for some reason right you will then realize that getting things to compile can be annoying because you need to make sure everything that you pass as an input has to match exactly the same type that you declare. Basically, in functional programming, everything is pretty explicit in, for the type system because it actually needs you to make sure the type holds, right? So today we'll go through this topic and then kind of like kind of formalize and then see what we can do with this concept of the type system. But before we begin, let's do a quick, uh, really, really quick recap, right, on the things we have covered so far. So last week we talked about function closure on Thursday, right? And was it what, what the heck is function closure, right? Uh, basically, function closure thinks about it as a scope of a function's definition. Basically, when I declare a function, when I declare a function, when does everything I declare take effects? What value should it have? And when should I keep maintaining those things? And the 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 other question that we are answering last week is when I declare a function and the function use a variable x, y, and c, what's the value of those x? Like what if I change the value of x later? What if I name something? to replace the old definition of x, right? So function closure it, it, in, a, in a more like a language definition is basically a function when it gets called, you're gonna use a variable inside the function based on the environment where you define it. Basically you take a time machine, yay, right? Even though you don't have that, but you take a time machine, whenever you declare that function, you go back in time use everything in that environment and you're done with the function calls, come back. And this is basically called lexical scope, right? So we actually did some uh, example here, right? And basically from this example, right? Whenever the, the, we declare and use, right? Whenever do we declare and use the function foo here, right? Foo on line six, know that it's called by value where we use the word val instead of def, right? But call by value will kind of force you to kind of evaluate this, right? So on that line, on that line, on line six, X is 12, Y is four, X has been updated. But the inside of function foo itself, if you look at this, the value of X, which is this guy, right? Will be the old value, which is 11, right? So the results of this particular function, uh, the x plus y over there is going to be 16 but inside the function you basically going to add 11 plus 16 it's not 12 plus 16 right so that's a definition of lexical scope whenever you call the function pool go back in time take a time machine go back to line two it's like okay when did i define x because it's been replaced already by 11 and that's how you're going to evaluate it right uh Using this example, because somehow foo would take the value of x in the old environment, which means that when you execute the code, right, you have to basically think of it this way: the system, the computer, right, you have to remember this old environment as needed. Sometimes they can replace it with value, which is awesome. You don't have to remember as many things. Sometimes you cannot, which is kind of not as awesome, but you still have to remember it. So, uh, function definition basically contains two parts. Right. The code itself basically is the function that you write, right? And the environment at the point where you define a function, which is okay, so what should I replace a variable x with? Is it gonna be another different variable that is has some unknown value or it's uh, some known constant, right? And this is the part where we kind of like call it function closure. You kind of teleport it back. To the old environment and you can't really manipulate it right 
Another idea, which is kind of like the inverse of lexical scope, is what we call dynamic scope, which is just, so I wouldn't, I was about to say the same thing, but it's not. Um, it basically means that when you call a function, if and if the language uses the di dynamic scope, it means that when you call a function, instead of using the environment when it's defined, you use the environment when it's being run right now at that line, right? And there are quite a body of researchers that, that shows more benefit of using lexical scope over dynamic scope. But, but the reason why I introduce both lexical scope and dynamic scope is in research, right? Most of the thing, actually, now I'm going to go side topic a little bit, right? And talk about research. Uh, there's going to be a lot of body of research to back something up. But sometimes, some some sometimes you have the researcher that come up with a totally novel idea to take advantage of the old thing that was that was kind of like almost proven that's going to be not as useful but there's a different way to use it so it's handy to know what is the dynamic scope it might become useful in the future who knows or at the moment most languages are going to assume lexical scope Right. So if you kind of like want to discuss with me about like the, the, the more like philosophical aspect of research, feel free to let me know after class, after the lecture, I'd be more than happy to discuss it. Right. Uh, this is some of the thing that I think you all should be aware of some a little bit, like how to read technical report, how to read things, or read papers, or how to read the uh, technical writing to apply it to your own engineering problem in the in the long run. Anyway, any questions about the things we covered last week? Any question about function closure? Uh, closure. All right, so uh, I apologize for the noise in the background. It should be done soon. Basically, we are boiling the water of the uh, kettle uh, for coffee. And basically, let's actually now move on to uh, the type system, right? So let's dive into it because this is one of the core things that that we touch or we haven't really, really talked about it yet, right? What is a type? Can someone tell me what is the example, just an example of a type? Just to make sure you are still here, to be honest, <laughs> because I've been logging for a bit. Yes, int, boolean, uh, tuple of int and int, uh, a list, right? These are the type, right? So if you kind of want to generalize, what, what does it mean to be a type? Basically, it's like it's a prediction, right? that, hey, when I'm going to evaluate my expression, right, when I evaluate the expression, they are going to have this property. So what does it mean for something to be an int? Can someone tell me what does it mean for, for uh, an expression to be evaluated to an integer? It should be a number, right? And and there's actually a little bit more strict with it because number can mean many, many things, right? So a whole number, awesome. Yeah, so a little bit expansion of that. It should be a whole number, right? Um, integer is kind of like a subset of a real number. So basically, if you define something to be an integer, you cannot make it express something like 1.5. Right? In some languages, 1.5 would be rounded up to 2, right? or sometimes it's 1, depending on how the, the, the program interpreted. Right? And this is known during the compile time. Why is that the case? So why, why can't the computer tell what type this thing is going to be? Who tells the computer that? We tell, yes, exactly, right? You write the program. So basically it means you are telling the computer, hey, that expression is gonna have that type. Why is that useful? It basically makes things, to be honest, if you think about it, more, more on the usefulness 
point of view, right? And I kind of want to make everything more abstract and just look at the high level. If I know if this is going to be a number and it's a, it's a whole number, right? It kind of guarantee that if somehow I have a fraction, something might be going wrong. I, someone might use the wrong type of input calling the fun function in the wrong way, right? So basically that's kind of like, to be honest, can be used to kind of enforce some safety nets, right? Uh, on top of it, if you know the type of the expression, right? Uh, you can actually do quite a bit of optimization. Anyone here, are you familiar with the concept of array as or as linked list? I assume to some extent, yes, right? So for those of you who are taking system skill class or who will be looking to take the class, anyone here who took the class, remember that old friend we call Cash? And those who haven't taken the class yet, right? If you look at when you want to buy a processor, like Intel processor or AMD processor, there's one specification in there that say, this is the size of the L1 cache, the L2 cache, and there are going to be a few hundred kilobytes for the L1, or maybe one megabyte for the L1 or two megabytes for the L1, and bigger for the L2 caches. It's basically is a really, really fast memory. Stick inside the CPU. Why do we need it? Because DRAM, the memory that we buy, actually, if you want to access those things, it's going to take about 15 to 30 to 40 times, depending on your access pattern, to get your data from the memory, right? Remember our old friend linked list and array. What is the main way you can tell what is the next node inside your linked list? How can you tell okay, that's the next item? It's a pointer, right? The pointer is not now. If you take C before and you implement the linked list with a C, uh, basically C language, if you implement it in Java, basically it's another object, right? You basically have another object that kind of held this new node, right? And can I guarantee in any way, what would that address be? Are they going to be actually physically next to the old node? Anyone wondering that and kind of print the result of the address that you got when you malloc? And are they actually next to each other? And if that answer is no, I haven't tried. Actually, that's a totally valid answer. But one quick thing about linked list, and this is kind of like being established as the possibility that it's going to happen a lot is, when you create, let's say you create three nodes, right? When you create the three nodes of the linked list type, right? It's a linked list of a node of int. There will be every value DRAM. What about array? What would be the location of the first item versus the second item versus the third item? Does it guarantee something? There'll be the odd, basically, be, the, it would actually guarantee they're going to be next to each other. So if you look at the main memory, right? This is your memory. This is an array. It will be allocated like this. Item one, item two, item three. But if you have something like a linked list, right? Linked list. Item one might be here, and then item two might be here, and then item three might be here, right? And if you are uh, basically, if you remember what we cover in system skill, so basically right now I'm gonna try to tie things together, but it's okay if you haven't taken the class before. Just remember this. If I know that I'm gonna have these three items sitting next to each other, it's so much easier. It's so much easier to make sure this whole three thing is in the fastest memory that I have in my computer, which is the L1 cache. Right. So if I have a good type type system and I know that data type is gonna be an array, what can I do? If I'm listening to my cat sneezing next to me. 
So what can I do if I know the data type is going to be an array? I know the ad I'm likely to know the address of everything in your array, right? Basically kind of know, okay, item one will be here, which means item two, three, four, five, six, seven here will be at these addresses because they're gonna be a bundle of contiguous address. So I can put that in the cache, right? The compiler actually, the compiler can take a look at it. Like, oh, okay, I can optimize this thing because I know that's an array and a certain optimization you can do to make array faster. At the same time, at the same time, if I see, okay, this is a linked list. Linked list, the, 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 the way you access thing in the linked list from the system point of view, we call this pointer chasing. Anyone want to take a guess why we call this pointer chasing in linked list? For those of you who have taken, taken a system skill before, why do we call a link the way we traverse the linked list pointer chasing? You are basically, how do you get the next node in the linked list? How do you get the next item in the linked list? Yeah, uh, well, except you didn't take the same skill, but your answer is perfect. Basically, each node point to the other, right? So you basically chase this pointing around until you finish the whole linked list, right? And that's it. That's the concept of pointer chasing. So you know it's a linked list, the way you optimize it in the computer, in the in the actual hardware, will be different. Actually, I'm not. I was about to say can be different, but it's a fact. It's going to be different, right? Because actually, to be honest, that's my research, right? The way we treat array and the way we treat linked list are going to be different in the hardware. If we can confer this type right to the hardware, it's gonna make this thing actually faster. Which is sound which sound magical, but it's true, right? To generalize this, because we, again, side topic for like five minutes. Now let's come back to our main topic. If the expression is the string type, it will eventually, what does it mean for the type? It will eventually become the string. These allow the compiler to make a lot more assumption. These allow the programmer to make more assumption. These allow even the hardware to make a lot of assumption, right? So, from the performance point of view, from the performance point of view, this sounds good, right? It basically gives everyone more information. So I know how to optimize certain things, right? So this is a good thing. Uh, so let's actually define a new type in Scala, right? So we went through multiple of these examples, such as a class, a trait, and an object, right? So how do we use a class? You can say, hey, class, class name, trade, trade name, object, object name, right? And that, that's basically how we can use the things, right? And uh, what are the bit, anyone will take a stab at what would be the differences between these three things? So let me ask the simplest question. What is the, what's unique about object compared to class and trade? And we discussed it before. I just want to refresh. There's only one instance, right? We call this is a it's a singleton item. It's only one thing. Yay, static. What about class and trait? What's unique about class? Basically, when I say something, hey, that's a class. What do they actually come with? Things like constructor, things like methods, right? Things, things like attributes. So you think about it, class is kind of like the, the the more complex things out of all this. But I mean, I don't think it's a fair comparison to, to say it that way, but you, you got it, right? With, it, with the class, you have like method. You are able to create constructor. You are pure, be able to create like basically little functions tied to the class. You can also use the type keyword. Say, hey, type, my type equals the list or a pair of lists, right? So that you can be lazy and use the word my type to replace the more uh, 
uh, different types that will require many more keystrokes to type on the keyboard more uh, longer, right? And to use the type after you declare it, right? You can just refer to a uh, class name, trade name, object name, and the type name, right? The dot type for the object name here basically allow you to distinguish between a class and an object, right? A class and an object. Uh, so there's a one quick caveat. Basically, when you say dot type, right? It, it's kind of like, hey, I'm going to distinguish between this one single done object and the class, right? And uh, when you define a type, right? When you define a type, especially when a new type kind of being constructed from some existing type, you are asserting some rules, right? So what would be the rule involving a string? What would be the restriction of data that goes into a string? What would be the, the ground rule for a string? So a string should be what? It's, yes, it consists of a bunch of character, right? That that you essentially by default it becomes an array, right? And generally, right? Generally, if you want to kind of like put the rules together, think of it as like a, a set, right? What is a set? Actually, let let me make sure we are all on the same page here. Uh, are you all familiar with the concept of set in math mathematics? Just want to make sure we we. Make, put that into our cash basically you you i'm sure everyone learned learn it a long time ago so if you think of a set if you think of a set there are things that uh inside the set which we call a subset oh can you mutate string in scala uh no so string in scala is immutable when you change the string it basically means you create a new string does it, does it answer your question? So basically you are creating a new one. Yay, right? you got a new uh, string out of that mutation. And you still can keep the old uh, definition of your string. All right, so to proceed forward, basically that is, if you think of the things as a set, right? That is this upper bound. Upper bound, which now we denote as A, this like less than colon sign B. Basically, it means that A extends B. A would A extends B. It means that B, it over here, basically, it kind of, let me put it into more like a wording. A extends certain properties of B, right? A extends certain properties of B. Lower bound me <clears throat> means that you use the inverse inverse direction of the sign a greater than colon b means that in this case b extends a b extends a so that's the lower bound right same things same concept with the set upper bound lower bound upper bound is like superset lower bound subset right so let's actually go through some examples so hopefully this is more clear for everyone uh. First, let's start with the upper bound. Let's first make some nested decoration. And because I own a cat, I'm going to use the, the animal as the kind of like the our universe of things. Uh, so we can declare an abstract class animal. And I can say, hey, this thing can have a name. Right? I can name an animal. What will happen if I say abstract class pet extend animal? What does it mean? What does it, what does this mean basically? Yeah, basically pet is like inside the animal, right? A X and B means that A is gonna be something inside B. 
it means that you can kind of like have properties of animals, right? Which means that if I define a class cat, which extend pet, right? It means that I can say I'm going to replace the name of the, I guess, the animal type into a string cat, right? And I can actually now define a new function called meow, you know, which is basically means that uh, my cat, my cat, right, can say meow, right? But if I basically create a different class called dog, which extend pet, right? In this case, the function meow should not exist unless it's super weird doc, right? Do they exist? The doc that can meow? I don't think so. I have not I haven't seen that on YouTube yet, but you I might be surprised, right? I never actually look. But a common uh, thing a doc can do is barking. So I can define a function called bark, which can return a string called woof woof, right? So the reason why this is called the upper bound is this. What is a common thing inside our animal pets, cats, and dogs? What is a common thing? They're going to have a name, right? Yeah, they have a name. So if you think about it, Animal is the most generic, right? Pet can be like kind of like a subset of animal, but the concept of upper bound kind of means that if I'm a pet, I can do what animals can do, but more because I have my own definition, right? For example, these are the things that animal can do, which is I have a name, right? But I have also something specific to myself, which is being able to meow and being able to bark. Right, so this is why we call this upper bound. Basically, uh, I can also call uh, uh, basically create another class called lion, right? Which is now not extending directly from pets, so it's not a it's not belong to pet world, right? But it still belong to animal world, which means that I can still have the name and I can still have this like drawing, which is. Uh, not sure how to pronounce it, yeah. <laughs> but if you think about it this way, basically, basically, you can create a class or create a type, right, and have something extend from that type. When you extend something, something from certain type, it's a subtype of that, but they might be able to do some more things. Any questions so far about the upper bound example? Okay, so let's let's keep going on with this particular example and extend this a little bit with with uh one more thing. So let's create a kennel, right? I can create a class called bad kennel, which takes in pet, right? And I put a pet in a kennel, right? So uh, I can do better. I can do better and say. This class kennel is going to take in anything defined as P, P, and P belong to pet. Because I, I, for sure, I cannot put lion in a kennel. My kennel that I can buy from the, the uh, pet shop will not hold a lion. They will shoot through the plastic and I'll die, right? So I can say, hey, the kennel will take anything, anything that belongs to pet. Right. Any guess why this is a better version than the bad kennel, which I define right here? So what's the restriction of the first definition? What can I put in the kennel? What the what is the type? Actually, what's the type? It has to be a pet, right? Which means that if I have a cat, if I have a cat, can I put it here? If I want to make sure this is strongly typed, yep, you cannot. <laughs> it was like, hey, it doesn't match. I don't know how to put a cat in a kennel. What about the second one? What about the second one? I said, I can put P, 
I can put in P. Can I put a cat in? Yes, right? Because I put in this restriction and say, hey, P has to belong to pet. <laughs> P can be anything. Pet is your upper bound. Right? Can I put in lion? No, right? Because lion is not extending from pet. It was extended from animal. And pet, while they are belonging to animal, it doesn't mean that you can put lion in there because you didn't define it that way. You define that lion is an animal, but it's not a pet. So to use this, once you have the definition, you can say, hey, val dog kennel equal new kennel and the type dog, new dog, right? This will create a new kennel to keep one pet Specifically, this is going to keep one dog, right? So if I define it this way, can I keep a cat? No, right? Because you, you now make it more strictly defined. The dog kennel is going to keep a dog. And uh, uh, same logic. I can't say fair lion kennel equal new kennel lion because lion is what? Basically, if I if I write this, is lion, uh, is pet the upper bound of lion? This is false, right? So you cannot, yeah, you cannot, because lion is not a pet, right? So if you take the concept of upper bound and index steroid, right? Let's look at the limit. There's this thing called infinite type, right? which kind of means that that can be any object, right? Any object in the universe. That can be your upper bound limit, right? Animal would belong to this particular any object, right? Kind of everything and then nothing. Uh, so this kind of put the upper bound. And if you think about it, also put the lower bound, put the lower bound on what can belongs to what. Nothing, if you look at the set and draw comparison here, it's like the universe and the empty set, right? Empty set contains what? What does the empty set contain in mass? It contains nothing, right? Basically the definition, the, the actual definition of an empty set is nothing. So that's your lower bound, lower limit. The universe, means that it's a set that can't can contain anything, right? So that's the any, that's the upper bound limit. So now that we talk about upper bound, let's talk about lower bound. So lower bound means that the type that you can select must, must be equal to the super type or the same type of the lower bound. When you use upper bound means that, for example, the dog has to belong to a pet, right? Which is okay. But lion is not because lion doesn't belong to a pet. Lower bound means that this is the minimum type. You have to be bigger than this. So for example, I have a class called A, right? Which has the lower bound of the list, list of integer. List of integer becomes the lower bound. You can do this. You can say B, Type B is traversable. Why is this okay? Why is that I, I okay to say B is traversable, which means that I can define X to have the property of A belong to class A, right? Yes, exactly, because you can traverse the list. Right, exactly, because you can traverse the list, which means that if you put the list to be your app, uh, lower bound, if the list is uh, your lower bound, traversable is kind of like, yeah, it's the same property that the list has, right? Which means you can use this. Uh, X, which is now what I define a new uh, uh, object, right? Not, not object, like a new name, my bad. A new name that has property of class A, class A. I can put list into it and I can also put 
set a set into it because a set is traversable, right? So traversable, right? Traversable becomes the lower bound. Anything that I use in A, anything that I use in A, it just has to be traversable. List is okay. Set it is okay, right? Because both list and set are traversable. Are they exactly the same type? No. There's so many things different about list and a set, but they're both traversable, right? So to think about this in a human language, yes, think about this way, lower bound, lower bound, provide you the guarantee that at minimum, at minimum, you need to have this property, right? At minimum, you have to have this property. How about if I say y, right, y is new a type b equals setup int? Can I do, can I put the list there? So let's look at the difference between line number one and line number two. What did I change the lower bound to? in line number two. What's the, the lower bound in line number one is traversable, right? As long as anything I, I use for X is traversable, I'm good. What is the new lower bound? It's a set. Now it's a set, right? So it means that it means that I cannot do something like this. Y dot who list of one and two will become invalid now because what? Because it's gonna break the definition in this line, line number three, right? I, I can't even say I create this type, uh, this, this bar Y, because Y violate the definition we have in A. A set doesn't exactly is the same as a list, right? But a traversable is fine. So, with the concept of upper bound and lower bound, right, you probably start to see some idea about the transformation to be honest, like things like transformation of one type into another. And the fact that we can put restriction, right? We can put restriction of what does the type, what's, what's the certain properties, the like rules and constraint about certain types and how can we relax them or expand them? So let's parameterize it. What does parameterize mean? Can someone tell me what does it mean for if I want to parameterize something? Yeah, to kind of pass a parameter, right? So let's look at this. I say I want to define a function called pick random. It takes a type T. And I take in a sequence. Like SEQ is a sequence. Basically, it means that X, X is a collection and it has to have certain sequence. A linked list is a part of a sequence. So a linked list can work here as well. So X is a sequence of P and return type T, right? And someone ring the bell. So I'm gonna check the front door quickly. I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. So what does this do? Basically, these pick a random for, uh, we haven't defined the body of the function yet, but based on the name, it's likely that I'll pick something inside this sequence, x, right? And I'm gonna return one item. So let's go to some example. Uh, actually, this is basically how I can parameterize the type, right? I can parameterize the type, I pass it, can like the type to the definition. So here's some example. Let's tie this to our animal example, right? Um, to be honest, that's kind of like the most concrete thing we define so far is much better than A and B example that I use for the uh, lower bound. 
So let's tie this with animal and kennel example, right? So let's say I have a kennel name, which takes in an animal and I have a name, which is animal.name, right? And then uh, it's gonna return the kennel name and a new kennel. If I want to use this for a pet, right? If I want to use this particular kennel name for a pet, basically I have a pet, I have a kennel. I want to put the, be able to put the piece of paper on a kennel and name the kennel, right? I have to do this. I have to say, hey, this type T, right? Your type T belongs to a pet, basically, because we put the restriction, right, way back when we defined a kennel, that a kennel type T, right, the kennel of type T has to be belonging to a pet. And also the animal, the animal also, uh, can be typed. Basically, pet belongs to animal, so that's fine, right? That's fine. But now we've now put the restriction that whatever name you're gonna put here and whatever animal you're gonna put here, which is a type T, has to be a pet, right? So now we kind of parameterize. Basically, you put the keyword type T and you basically put the restriction on what T can be. There's a restriction on what T can be. You pass in, hey, this is going to belong to a pet. It can be a cat. It can be a dog, right? You haven't defined it yet, but it's, it's a parameterized value. It just belongs to a pet. Okay. So any, actually, any questions so far? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I can be explained the upper bound. Sorry if I missed your text. Oh, okay, so let, let's actually go back to that to clear things up, right? Uh, here, wait, where? Here. You are asking about this, right? Okay, so let's actually go through this again. Uh, we do have time. The question is, why is, so I'm going to use a different color text. Uh, let's do blue. Why is the version one worse than version two? Right. So if I want to use the kennel in version one, what do what does P have to be defined? What should be the type of P? What should be the type of P? If I want to use the version one, it has to be a pet, right? It has to actually strictly, strictly be a pet. It has to definitely be a pet, which means that can I use this for a cat? And can I use it for a dog? The answer is really, I cannot, right? Because a cat doesn't, is not the, exactly the same type as a pet. Cat extend pet. But it doesn't mean cat is the same or equal to pet, right? It extends pet. Dog extends pet as well. So this means that this particular example, it means that if I want to use this kennel, I somehow have to strictly use it on the data type pet, right? But the second part, the second definition right here, it means what does this do? What does this do? What that, uh, what type, I guess, let me ask this question. What type do I take in here? We, the input is type P, right? It puts, we, by definition, we put on the first line, we take in something that has type P. With me so far? Okay. And this particular definition, Right, this particular definition right here, it put a restriction on what P can be. We say, hey, we want to take a type P as an input and we now define that P has to what? Pet is your upper bound. It belongs to anything that in, that are in the pet world, right? So which means that this can be a cat, this can be a dog, right? 
So now I can say, hey, new kennel cat. New kennel and put a dog in, right? So that's fine, right? So with me so far. Okay, awesome. So that's a difference. <laughs> so basically, that's it. it. It actually gives you the ability to kind of like convey more than one really strict type, right? So now we talk about parameterizing the type, which is basically pass in the T, P, or uh, like definitely, basically variable, right? Make a type of variable over here. The example use the, the letter T. Uh, the earlier example with the kernel, we use the letter capital P, right? These are parameterizing the type. The next concept that we're gonna learn is what we call a variant, right? Variance. Uh, Actually, I think we're about halfway through. So actually more than halfway through, but let's take a quick break. Is that okay? Basically, this is a, another concept. I want to make sure uh, it's clear. So let's take a quick break and and we'll be back around 1256, 57, maybe three to four minutes break, just to have a mental break in the middle, right? In the meantime, this is the, the, the basically the perfect time to ask questions. All right. I'm going to be here. Basically, I'm not taking the break. If you have questions comes in, uh, type in the questions and we will talk about variance in a bit. All right. Quickly. All right. Now that the break is over. So let's talk about the definition of variance. Basically, it's a ability of the type parameters make sure you 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 got this is the parameter the a the t that we've been using is the ability of that parameter to vary on hind kind of types and i'm gonna expand this definition a little bit because i know it doesn't help it doesn't help in terms of understanding so let's say we can use c of a c of a a higher kind of type C of A means that it means that it conform, it conform to C of B, and you can assign C of B to C of A without error. What does conform mean in English? Because I want to make sure you 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 understand the part that we are trying to use English language to explain, and the part that are more like a formal definition. And I want to make sure you link the two together to make it less confusing. What does conform mean in English? Can someone go look at the dictionary definition? Because basically that's what we're trying to do here. What does conform mean? Yep, comply with the rules. And that's a perfect, actually, perfect definition. You can use C or B with no error, right? It, 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 it still abide by the rule. A higher kind type C of A is say to abide by the rule. If you use C of B and assign C of B to C of A with no error. And we'll, we'll go through some example. We'll go through some example, I promise you. But before we go through some example, I have to first tell you that three types of invar uh, three types of variance. Invariance means that if type A equals type B, if A equals B, then, then, C of A, right, C of A will conform to C of B. Covariance means that if A extends B, then C of A will conform to C of B. Contravariance is the inverse. If A extends B, then C of B conform to C of A. So let's actually go through some 
uh, longer definition and I because I can't fit everything on one slide. Invariance is a little bit simple if the type is the same. C at A will conform to C of B. But let's look at covariance and contravariance and figure out what the heck do they mean. So for covariance, right? Covariance. One example is a list of cat, a list of cat is going to be the subtype, right? Of a list of animal. Why is that the case? Why is a list of cat a subtype of a list of animal? Because basically cat extend pet and pet extend animal, right? It's kind of like cat is an animal. So a function that return, if it's called covariance, if it's a covariance, a function that returns a list of cats type parameter is a covariance with the function that returns a list of animal, a list of animal. Contravariance is kind of like the inverse of that. Still use the cat and animal, but the parameter for a function that return a string, it return a string. It basically, it doesn't return a list of cat. It return a string, and an input is a cat. Right? You input a cat, got a string. Input a cat, got a string. Is there a contravariance with the parameter for a function that again return the same thing, a string, but now input is an animal. Covariance has to do with the returning. Contravariance over here has to do with the input. You input a cat, get get a string. You input an animal, also get a string. Right? Is it more clear with this example? Any questions, especially uh, any questions on, on, on this particular example on um, what are the key differences between covariance and contravariance? Does covariance need to consider inputs as well? Uh, yes. It, it does have to say, it does have to make sure that things extend for the other thing, A extend B, right? Over here, a cat is a subtype of an animal. That's why you can have the covariance because returning, right? Returning a list of cat, returning a list of cat is a covariance with returning a list of animal. So does it answer your question? All right. Uh, okay. I, I hope there's no kind of, but hopefully if you have more follow-up questions, feel free to type it in and hopefully I don't miss them. So sorry about earlier. All right. So let's actually use this in Scala, right? So we can define, we can define covariance. Basically these things we can, we actually have to define. Scala is a strongly typed language. So anything we do should have a definition, definition tied to it. For example, the type P earlier, we defined that has to belong to pet, right? Otherwise we can't use a cat and a dog. But once you say, hey, that P belongs to pet, then you can use it for a cat and for a dog. So now let's define covariance. The way you do this is to use the plus sign. Example here is plus T, right? For example, list of plus T. Basically anything that is a covariance of p for example the list of animal right the list of animal if t is cat list of plus t would also work with the list of animal with me so far and defining oh yeah sure so when you use the word uh, key, key uh, well, I guess the symbol plus with the parameter, 
hybrid over here. Let's say what would happen if I say list of plus cat. A cat is a type, right? So what does cat extend from? Animal, right? Well, it extends from pet and pet extends from animal. So over here, it's this, this rule, this rule would work with list of animal, right? It would definitely work with list of cat, right? It would definitely work with the list of cat, but it will also work with the list of animal because you say, hey, I'm going to put this rule. Let's say anything that is a covariance with T, right? I say, hey, it's a covariance of T. So with me so far? Okay, so the contravariance, surprise, you have the minus sign. <laughs> Anything that's narrower than T. And that's it, basically. Minus T means it's a contravariance, right? So let's actually use an example to, to make this more clear. And I'm going to define a cat kennel, a dog kennel, which basically the cat kennel would take in a new cat, dog kennel would take in a new dog, right? Didn't we so far, basically, yes, no? About this particular example. And I have a definition called get name that takes in the kennel of pet and we'll do k.pet.name. And if you type this in on Scala, it will basically yell at you. Anyone want to take a guess? What is wrong with it? Uh, well, yeah, but there's actually more glaring mistakes here, uh, which is ha which has to do with with the the variance problem, right? K is my input, right? It's a kennel of pet. What's missing? So can I use a kennel of cat and kennel of dog? If I say the input has to be the kennel of pet. No, right? So you think about this. Clear. Like basically, if you if you look, at, if you stare just a little bit and say, "Hey, I I kind of make it strict definition." I say, "K has to be a kennel of pet," but then, but then I use a cat and dog onto the kennel, right? Which will not work because it's it doesn't really have the ability to infer that hey, a kennel of cat and kennel of dog is fine, so. Typo, do not. Basically, the compiler, which is the scalar compiler, cannot make any assumption because you didn't tell them that, hey, a kennel of cat actually would work with a kennel of pet, right? So something is missing here, right? So let's continue on this example and say, look at how we can fix it. Look at how we can fix it, right? With me so far, because I'm going to kind of show how to fix it. Which is actually pretty simple. So let's fix the kennel class. Let's fix the kennel class. Right. Let's go back to our definition of kennel. We can put a cat in it. We can put a dog in it, but we can't really do anything with it, right? Because this is what's missing. There's one thing that's what's missing. What does this mean? What does this mean? First of all, the rest of it, everything here looks the same as the kennel class. The only difference is I have that plus sign. Is the plus sign covariance or contravariance? It's a, a co covariance, actually. It's covariance. Contravariance is a minor sign. Right, which mean which means that I'm gonna make sure P as long as it's within pet, as long as it's within pet, I can use it. 
I can use P and replace P with cat and dog and anything that is belonging to pet. Basically, that's all. Now, the definition would work. All right, with me? Yes, no? Okay, cool. So, the there's going to be, uh, uh, well, when you actually use this for the first time, when you have to program it for the first time. Uh, so yeah, so just P uh, less than e, a colon pet doesn't work. Uh, yes, because if you want to parameterize P, if you want to parameterize P, it would work if you want to make a dog kennel or the pet uh, uh, cat channel and dog kennel. But when you want to use this function, right? You can create the kennel. It's okay to create a kennel. Basically, this is okay. This is okay. It's just this part is not okay because you haven't tell the compiler yet that it works with anything that belongs to pet. So you can create the kennel, but you can't really you can't really make a generic function call that works on all pets. Right? So you can, yes, you can change the type parameter to be kennel pet and kennel dog, that works. But it means that if you, if a pet span uh, dog, cat, a mouse, fish, bird, one copy for each one of these type, right? And even though basically you want the same function, which is get me the name, right? So this, this allows you the, this particular, particular method allows you the convenience of, well, this apply for every pet, so I'm going to use it for every pet. And because Scalar and many, many functional language is a strongly typed languages, this has to be more than time explicitly defined, explicitly defined. Okay. Some higher level languages to be honest like a language that that gives you ability to kind of like do certain like python for example they're going to be a lot slower but it's more convenient uh, in our likelihood you can probably do something similar without this in like inferring the type like somehow python just change the data the data type based on what i need <laughs> so let's move on uh and look at the binary tree example we can make the left uh, <clears throat> basically, remember our old binary tree example where we have the node left and node right, right? So let's let's actually pass the left as any tree, right? So remember our CU trade binary tree, right? You can say T can be plus T, plus T is a type binary tree. And this would make the leap. That's why I'm so confusing here. L E A F. Make the leap possible. All right. Remember in binary tree example, the leap is a, an object of its own, it's an object of nothing. And we have to make a special function for the leap, right? And that's kind of annoying. So let's actually work through it again and make sure we can handle that if your binary tree, the T that comes in is a leaf, well, that would work too. Basically, I want to make sure binary tree of nothing can be treated as the binary tree of any tree, right? You can do this by saying plus T because you already define the trait binary tree, right? And you know that you can define the covariance of T to have either a tree or a nothing, and the function still work, right? The function will still work if T is a nothing or if a tree is a, another node in a binary tree, right? So you can basically now say object leave extend BT of nothing. And the node and the node here is now you can say BT of T, BT of T, T is a type, right? And the node extend BT of T. 
binary tree of the type. And now, and now the definition, the new definition of node here would work for a node of nothing and a node of tree. So covariance allows you to kind of parameterizing the type and group up. Basically, it's the ability for me to group things up and say this this type kind of belongs to this. So I'm gonna make sure these two types can be grouped with each other. Right. So let's look at uh, what if I want to create my own function. Let's say I have a function f, right? That text in a give b. Text in a give b. What we learned so far is that it might be okay if I pass in anything wider than than a because of the the whole type system and the contravariance and covariance and produce an output that doesn't use all the restriction of B. Basically, I'm going to text in something that may, may be wider than A and produce something that doesn't use all of B. What if you want to create a function that applies the argument? Okay, so here is the example. I want to create an, an, a function. Text in input and return output. Right. This is basically, I want to basically generate a trait that behaves like a mathematical function. So what's the definition of mathematical function? The function would do something to something and generate something. So what, is, what are those? So how do I define a, a mathematical function? What does the function do? It can be one to one, one to many. Uh, to, to be honest, basically the function take input, produce output, right? That that's like a really really weak definition of a function, but it works. It takes input, generate output. ARG the arguments here is the input, and it returns something, right? So that that's kind of like creating my own function, right? I will have some input. I'm going to apply the function and I return something with me so far. Basically, this is a really, really high level example, but I'm going to go deeper into what can you do with this argument as an input and output? So with me so far about this, this one example, I have a function, my function. I text in the argument type, return type, apply the function on the argument, return something. Yes, no, with me so far. So if I have a code below, if I have a code below, what is wrong with it? Someone tell me what is wrong with it? What did I restrict the type as when I define this trait? What did I do to myself? Yeah, so uh, I have a my function list of int, but I'm going to apply it to a sequence of int. Return anything, right? But I work, I, I barely make it return double, right? It should work, right? With, with the human, if, if you just eyeball this function, if I just, if you just eyeball the function, it seems fine, right? Everyone here agree that this seems fine. Right? Every, everything here seems fine. Yes, no, yes, no, yes. It seems fine. But it will give you a compilation error because of your, the reason you put basically stated here. A sequence of int is not exactly the same type as a list of int. Double is not the same type as any, but we all know, we all know that, well, if you take a sequence of int, it would work too, right? So we can fix it. We can fix it. Right now, the problem is just that the ARG that you put here is, we haven't defined it as the contravariance yet. 
right? And the return, we haven't defined it as a covariance yet, right? So we can fix it here, right? You can say the argument, the argument is going to be the anything that is a contravariance and the return is, would be anything that's a covariance of the type that you parameterize here. So now, now you fix it. Now this would work. Why is this again? Because a sequence of int is a contravariance with the list of int. While double is the covariance of any, right? List of int is narrower than sequence of int. Any is wider, wider. The definition of any is anything, right? It's wider than double. So you can apply the function now because you say, hey, I have a sequence of int. Well, it's, it's narrower with than the list of int. That's fine because we just say it here. Anything that's narrower than the argument works. And anything that's wider than the return, right? The return just has to be wider than your return, the actual return here, which is double, right? And that's all. So that's it for the contravariance and covariance. Any questions so far? All right, so if you if this confuses you and you're not sure how to ask a question or you, you haven't really like formulated the questions yet, uh, feel free to come back after the lecture period is over. I'm gonna be on Discord, right? So let's move on to dependency. Uh, what does it mean for something to be dependent on something else? And we're moving on to the topic of what we call dependency injection. But can someone tell me what's dependency? What does it mean? And that exactly is a great definition. It just means that something depends on something, right? It relies, that's a rely on, on something. And this can be useful in programming, right? Because it kind of allow you to manually control, it allow you to manually control the dependency that, hey, I can make sure that A is going to depend on B. And this is a concept called dependency injection. And you might have heard this from software engineering class, right? One object, one object supplies the dependent items to another. Basically, I have object A and object B and C. Basically, A and B, A generate what B and C need, right? A generate what B and C need. It supplies the dependent items to another. And in this case, we can decouple, right? We can decouple the actual implementation away from the abstraction. What does it mean? What does it mean? It means that we have this abstraction that, hey, before I run B and C, I want to make sure A supply the input into A and B. Oh, no, A supplies the input into B and C, right? It means that B and C relies on A, relies on A. But, if you are a programmer, you know that, well, if you have to implement something really, really, really big, right? You know that within the day, it's not like you're gonna finish implementing everything, right? How many people here finish your assignment in five hours? Or and how many people kind of like finish one part at a time? Anyone here finish part of the assignment at a time? And basically, I'm gonna leave the next part to tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah, so I think most people do it too. Basically, uh, you're gonna have a burst of energy and say, hey, I'm gonna implement this part of your assignment. And then the burst of energy goes down quickly. 
depending on how many compilers and error you're gonna get. <laughs> so as I'm like, oh crap, I'm gonna well brain is fry. My the matter in my head becomes the jelly is not called brain anymore. So I'm gonna do it tomorrow, right? So uh you dependency injection is kind of like the ability for you to decouple the actual implementation of the function from the abstraction. Basically, you just want to define, hey, this thing depends on this. This thing depends on this. I'm going to implement that later. I'm going to implement whatever I want to do here later. I just want to tell you there's a dependency here. So let's use an example, right? So let's assume I have a class X and it needs a database connection, right? I want to connect to a certain database repository. Why do I have to do that? Well, most application, surprise, need some back uh, back end database to make sure you can connect to a pool of data you've been gathering, right? But this particular call, this particular call, line number one here, it creates the dependency. It creates the dependency. But this dependency is tied, is tied to the repo, right? The repository that you put in here, it's strictly tied to this particular database. And you can't really change the name afterward, right? You can't really change the name afterward. What can go wrong here? Especially in software engineering. It might work on one project, right? Let's say you work on a project and say, hey, I'm going to connect to a database with this name. I'm going to implement everything that depends on this database. And then another company asks you, hey, can I use the same piece of software? Can you implement that for me? But I have a new data. Well, the, the database name would be different, right? So everything that you built, everything that you built earlier, it can depend on this particular database name. You have to make sure it works on the second company's database too, right? So you kind of need to make sure the name match, which is impossible, right? So dependency injection comes into play here. You decouple this dependency, right? You say, hey, I'm going to make a connection to the database, but I'm going to implement the database later. I'm going to implement the database later. I can make it work with one database here that I implemented. I can make it work with another database here that I implemented. It's the abstract definition that at some point I'm going to have that. I will be lazy. I'll just say, hey, there's a dependency here. And you have to wait, but I'm not going to implement it yet. With me so far, basically, you just define dependency but you haven't implemented the function that goes into this whole dependency tree. Yes, no, with me so far. So what does this kind of look like? You think about it, this kind of look like the inheritance and interface, right? It's kind of like abstract class, right? I define an abstract class and I haven't implemented, yes? So why can't we just keep extending our trade and kind of like make sure we it cover everything in the world, right? So we can say, hey, trade foolable and this is ordinary fool, right? What if I want to create a code that depends on foolable? I think next semester I need to rename these function calls because every time I use the slides, every time I'm like foolable is not easy to pronounce all the time. Including this function. Oh my god, I hit myself now. Uh, I create a class called var that use foolable. So the, the class is called var using foolable. Extend foolable. And inside the function, it actually use foo, right? So that's why you need to extend foolable. And you can write the main function that say val bar with foolable and create this object and print, right? So it seems okay, right? With, are you all with me that this kind of seem okay? Right? 
right? The problem here is, well, once you bind, once you make this binding that I label number one, once I bind it here, can I change foolable? Can I actually change bar with foolable? I made the connection already, right? That it's gonna use foolable, and whatever I do, I cannot change it. Yeah, I'm stuck. <laughs> Basically, now I'm stuck with foolable. This particular implementation of foolable, which defined here in line number two, I can't change it, right? Yes, are, we, are you all with me? Basically, I'm stuck. I'm stuck with this definition. It's okay. But if I need to change the definition later, I cannot, right? I cannot unless I want to make a totally new object or class or traits, right? With me? Yes. So let's actually try to use dependency injection and see how we can fix it. But the sample code here, uh, it won't compile yet, but you can use the word width, right? The width keyword, the width keyword, uh, will do certain. Basically, it it forces you to well, not force you, but it allows you to declare that hey, there's a dependency injection here. So I say hey, I am gonna have a class called bar using foolable, and then here's the opt uh the object main that has this width keyword right, right here. And this is done at instantiation. So uh, this isn't really, really compile if you actually put this on Scala, right? Even though the width keyword tie dependency injection, right? So let's actually look at, actually let's look at how we can fix it and why this is a problem. But before we go to that, again, there's some something that's kind of like an abstract method. So I want to get this over with, right? Something like this. I can say uh, I have the object that extend app. I have an abstract class, and if I need to change foolable, I have to keep extending this. I have to keep extending this abstract class right here, right? So this get messy. This get messy. So you want to use dependency injection in some cases, and the method is called baking a cake. Uh, sometimes we call this self-type annotation. So this is the same. This is the same, right? The foolable class, they're full. This is already a full. This is exactly the same thing. This is bar using foolable. Again, the same class the same class, but we have this arrow sign and def bar right over right here. Anything, basically with this particular syntax, anything that come after this arrow sign can use method and variable of foolable. Method and variable of foolable. So basically you can use this. You can use def foo. You can use foo, yay. Right. You can use full. With me so far, basically, if we have this self type annotation uh, and this particular baking a cake method, you can implement foolable and you can implement bar using foolable and have this arrow sign and say, hey, I'm going to use full defined in foolable. And with the with the declaration of this arrow sign, uh, the difference between the arrow sign and the keyword extend here, right? So that's the difference. We use the keyword extends before, and the extend is very type specific, right? You need to strictly have that exact type. The self type annotation, which is that arrow sign, the arrow sign means that. I'm gonna declare whatever goes in here will extend, will extend. The keyword that are important here is the keyword will. <laughs> I'll do it later. It will extend the trade. I'm not gonna define it yet. 
it doesn't actually extend it yet. It will, right? it will. But it needs to conform to the trade, which is basically it has to conform to foolable. That's why we call it baking. If you bake something before, it means that you mix a bunch of things and put it in the oven, right? And at some point in time, you're gonna get a cake, right? So it takes time, you do it later. That's why we call it baking a cake. The difference between this arrow sign and the keyword extend is the arrow sign will say, hey, it's gonna conform to foolable, but don't worry about it, I'll do it later. Can you do that with the extend? So let me ask you, can you do that with the keyword extend? No, right? Extends means I know exactly what I want to do and I have to define it now. With the arrow line, I'm just gonna be late. I, I, I don't wanna work today. I'll do it later. I will for sure extend the trade. And here is some example of how you can actually use this. So let's say I call it trade full service. This is my, uh, I guess the, our level is number one. This is the definition of full service. And I have two types of full service that I am defining it now, which is the default full and the luxurious version of full. And then I'm going to call a class as a bar that use full service. Basically, it, we want to use the full service one here, but I say, hey, I'm going to extend it later. So I will eventually use full for sure. Right now, I'm going to make sure it, it conform to the definition you have right here, the full service. And I'll use a function called full. Right? Do I bind? So let me ask you this. Did I bind yet whether this belong to uh, default or the luxurious version of full? Did I, did I make any promises at all? Which one do I, do I use? No, right? I haven't really... I haven't really like in detail, I'm gonna use default full, or I'm gonna use luxurious full. I just say that, hey, I'm gonna use full servers. At some point in time, I'll make this binding. I'll make this binding. And here's how you can use the the, the last group of lines here, just your main function, right? Your main function. And the first one, the name bar with default full, is the one that I use the keyword width, right? I use the keyword width, width. The keyword width now can bind, bind the bar using full service with this trade, the default service. And the second keyword width here, also it's binding, it's doing some binding. It binds to the luxurious version of full right here, right? So over here, over here, the reason why the keyword width works now is that first, both default full and luxurious full is now defined. Both of them are defined, right? Number line number two and line number three, they are all both like basically all of them are defined. Get me so far. And the other thing is the class bar using full service is not binding to any of the default full or luxurious full. So you can have a choice, right? When you want to use the class bar using full service, it will work with anything that conform to full service. It would work with anything conform to full service. What does this mean? It means that with this code, with this code, you have the option of using the default full or the better full, right? You can use both. And in the future, let's say if your customer comes in and, hey, I'm broke, I want poor's man full, right? I want a third option. Let's say, I, if I'm broke, I'm gonna use poor's man full. You can then build in another trait called poor's man full that extend full service and everything else in the code would still work, right? Now you have the third option to use full service. All right. Uh, is it more clear now that, hey, it, it gives you basically, this is dependency injection. 
it tells that, hey, these particular class, the bar using full service will depend on the definition of full inside full service. And I can define it now. I can extend it later. It just guarantee that I'm going to do some binding eventually on what, uh, what trait I'm going to use. All right. So actually that's it for the lecture today. We covered the type system and dependency injection. Uh, next. Oh, we don't have a class on Thursday because it's a holiday, but we have a makeup class on Friday, right? But before we leave today, there's a canvas for the skeleton code of dependency injection. Basically, we are asking you to implement a random draw, right? Using dependency injection. Uh, and then also feel free to discuss your project idea. I think it's about a good time to start thinking about what would make you excited. <laughs> what type of program would you like to, to try, right? And that's a great question. So originally, originally I put, let me look at my calendar because I remember for sure that I put it at 430, but I want to make an option for all of you because somehow my afternoon is free, which is a magical thing. So I'm free as after 1 p.m. Originally, I have a meeting at 3, it gets moved to 11. So now I'm free after 1 p.m. So anyone here has a conflict at 2 o'clock? If you have a conflict at 2 o'clock, please tell me right now so I can find a time that works. Can I do two o'clock? Friday, Friday. So can I do two to four Friday? Oh, you have a class at two? Okay. Uh, how about, so right now it's 4.30 to 6.30. Can I move it earlier to four? Would that work? Oh, is that two to six? I hope it's not two to six, it's like uh, hardcore. Okay, so let's do let's do two to six. Another option is I can do noon to two. Does noon to two work for all of you? Anyone here have a conflict from noon to two o'clock? So is it okay to do noon to two o'clock for all of you? Just want to double check for the last time. If you have a conflict, tell me right now. Okay, so let's do noon to two o'clock. Uh, somehow this is working on my schedule. It's awesome. Okay, so let me write it here, make up class, and I'll put it on an announcement. Noon to 2 p.m. Friday. And does this work for uh, for all of you in general? Because I, I if this works for all of you in general, this is a much I think there's a much better time for everyone here because it's not like Friday late night or something. So let's let's do noon to two o'clock on this Friday. I'm gonna because the uh WebEx uh I I'm not sure if I can reschedule this Thursday slot to Friday. If not, I'm gonna send a different a different meeting links. I put it on an announcement, all right. But otherwise, uh, let's do it noon to two o'clock. Okay. Okay, Friday, June fourth. All right.
Okay, so we have all 15 minutes left. I'm gonna switch over to Discord quickly in case you have any questions related to our well, now is assignment two, as well as the in class exercise, as well as any of the content, including discussion on the project or anything. Is that okay? Basically, I'm gonna switch over.